Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to play a game with my good friend, Aurora. It's known as Vitoff Snim. The rules are pretty simple. We have two piles of ducks, like so, and we take turns removing them. On your turn, you're allowed to remove as many ducks as you want from either pile. Or you can remove an equal number of ducks from both piles at the same time. The winner is the player who takes the last duck. Let's play a sample game so you can see what I mean. We'll start with two piles of sizes 5 and 10. I might take two ducks from each pile, leaving 3 and 8. Then Aurora would take three ducks from this pile leaving three and five. And I might take another two from this pile, leaving one and five, and she would take three from this pile, leaving one and two. Then I could take one from each pile, and Aurora would take the last duck and win. Good game. Of course, I don't want to lose again, and I can't rely on Aurora making a mistake. She never does. So, I'll need to be better prepared for next time around. What strategy can I use to be sure that I can win? In a previous video, Aurora and I played a closely related game called Nim, where you're only allowed to take ducks from one pile or the other, but not from both at once. In studying Nim, we developed a whole theory of impartial games, but for today, we'll only need one of our tools. P and N positions. A P position is a position where the player who just moved into that position, the previous player, can guarantee a win, assuming they play perfectly going forward. And an N position is a position where the next player to move wins. From an N position, the next player has a winning move, and after that move, that player will become the previous player, so the resulting position will be a P position. But from a P position, there can't be a winning move, so every move will give the opponent a winning play, and will thus be an N position. In other words, an N position can always go to at least one P position, but a P position can only go to Ns. With this characterization, we can start classifying positions in Vitoff Snim as P or N. The position where both piles have zero ducks, which we'll write with zero in the first pile and zero in the second, is a P position, since whoever took all the ducks just won. And any position that can get there with either one empty pile or two equal piles will be an N position. Then 2, 1 can only reach 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 1, all of which are N positions, so 2, 1 is a P position, and by similar logic, so is 1, 2. And all the positions that can reach either of those are N positions, and so on. If we keep going like this, we can eventually classify every position as either P or N. This isn't a very efficient way to solve the problem, though, and more importantly, it doesn't give us any intuition for what's going on. So let's draw a picture and see what patterns we can find. We have a bunch of pairs of numbers corresponding to sizes of piles, and pairs of numbers always cry out to be plotted on a graph. So let's plot the P positions in red and the N positions in blue. It's a bit tedious to evaluate these positions and plot everything by hand, but we've got computers for that. We can just write some code to evaluate all the piles up to, say, size 100, and draw the plot for us. And when we do, we get this. Huh, it looks like there's some structure to the red points there. Let's get rid of the blue ones so we can see that a bit clearer. Sure enough, those look like two lines of points. 
And when you have a line, the most important parameters are the slope and the intercept. Both lines pass through the origin, so the intercepts are both zero. And we can get the slopes by dividing the y and x coordinates for the points farthest from the origin, which gives us about 1.618 and 0.618 respectively. Wait, I know those numbers. Made a video about them, in fact. They're the golden ratio, phi, and its reciprocal, 1 over phi, respectively. What are those doing here? Now that we know we should expect lines in the golden ratio, let's take another look at those coordinates. We'll focus on the points on the upper line of p positions. The lower line will have the same coordinates, but in the opposite order, it's just swapping the piles, so all the same logic will apply. We can number our points 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And then we can plot the x-coordinates of our points against those numbers. So we'll get 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 6, 5, 8, and so on. We'll end up with a graph like this, which looks pretty linear. Once again, the intercept is 0, and the slope is about 1.618, about phi. That tells us that the nth x-coordinate is roughly n phi. And sure enough, if we list out the values of n phi, we get 0, something a bit more than 1, something a bit more than 3, a bit more than 4, 6, 8, 9, and so on. If we clean that up a bit by rounding these down to get rid of all the fractional bits, that is, if we take the floor function, then these two sequences will match up. So the x-coordinate for the nth p position seems to be the floor of n phi. Okay, how about the y-coordinate? Well, if we do the same procedure, so plot the y-coordinates, get a line, find its slope, we'll find that the nth y-coordinate looks like n phi squared, again rounded down with a floor function. And that makes sense, since we estimated the slope of the p positions to be phi, so the y-coordinate should be about phi times the x-coordinate. So it seems like our p positions are given by floor of n phi, floor of n phi squared. I should emphasize, we're still exploring here. We haven't actually proved anything yet, but this is certainly a promising pattern to follow up on. Both of these sequences, floor of n phi and floor of n phi squared, are examples of what are known as Beatty sequences. Given an irrational number r, the associated Beatty sequence, br, is floor of r, floor of 2r, floor of 3r, and so on. It's the multiples of r rounded down. For example, the multiples of square root of 2 are 1.414, 2.828, 4.243, and so on. So the Beatty sequence for square root of 2 is 1, 2, 4, 5, and so on. Note that we're leaving out the leading zeros, just remember that we have them for later. Beatty sequences have a really interesting property. The complementary sequence of a Beatty sequence, that is, the numbers that it excludes, also forms a Beatty sequence for another number. For instance, this sequence here is missing 3, 6, 10, and so on, which turns out to be the sequence for 2 plus the square root of 2, known as the silver ratio. More generally, Rayleigh's theorem gives us that other number explicitly, as s is r over r minus 1. And sure enough, the square root of 2 over root 2 minus 1 is 2 plus root 2. The proof is mostly just algebra, and you can pause here and read it if you like. The upshot is that no number appears in both the sequence for r and the sequence for s, and no number gets skipped in both sequences either. Conveniently for us, if r is phi, then s comes out to phi squared, which means that our coordinates here 
are two complementary Bayes sequences. So every positive integer appears in exactly one of these two sequences. And remember, we have two lines, one for each order of the coordinates, and also those zeros we set aside earlier. So each whole number appears exactly once as an x-coordinate and once as a y-coordinate. Actually, as we just described it, any two complementary Bayes sequences would give us every whole number. But the golden ratio in particular gives us one additional nice feature. If we look at the differences between the y and x coordinates for each of our points, then we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Why does that happen? Well, the nth difference is the floor of n phi squared minus the floor of n phi. And the defining feature of the golden ratio is that phi squared is phi plus 1. So we can substitute that in and distribute the n, and n is a whole number, so we can bring that out of the floor, and then the floor of n phi cancels with the minus floor of n phi, leaving us with just n. So the nth difference is n. And if we swap the order of the coordinates, which means looking at points on the lower line, that gives us a difference of negative n. That means not only do we get every whole number once as an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, we also get every integer once as a difference between the two. Translating all this back to our game, we can plot our Bayes sequences to get this line here. And we can plot them with the coordinate swapped to get this other line. Then we can find our current position, which is given by the sizes of our two piles, on this plot. If we're in this top left region here, which means the ratio of the piles is more than phi, then we can move down by removing ducks from the second pile to get to a red point. And we are guaranteed to hit one, we can't slip through the gaps, since every x-coordinate appears once. And similarly, if we're in this bottom right region, so the ratio of the piles is less than 1 over phi, then we can move left to hit a red point, since every y-coordinate appears once. And if we're in this top right region here, between the two lines, so the ratio of piles is between 1 over phi and phi, then we can instead move diagonally by taking the same number of ducks from each pile. And again, we're guaranteed to run into one of the points, since there's always a point with the same difference between the y and x. What if we're actually on one of the red points? Well, we won't be able to go down to another red point, since each x-coordinate only appears once. We can't go left, since each y-coordinate only appears once. And we can't go diagonally, since each difference only appears once. So we can't reach another of our points. That means that from any position that isn't a red point, we can always reach a red point. But from any of the red points, we're forced to step away. And that's how we defined our P and N positions. So all these red points, which we've defined by our Beatty sequences, are the P positions. And everything else on this plot is an N position. In practice, instead of actually plotting the points, it's easier to just look at the ratios of the sizes to decide whether we should remove from the larger pile or from both. And we can use the Beatty sequences to find the right target. Okay, this theory is cool and all, but remember, we're here to win a game, not just to look at pretty math. So let's put it all together and challenge Aurora to a rematch. Once again, we have piles of sizes 5 and 10. I'll start by taking the ratio. 10 over 5 is 2, which is more than phi. So I know I'll need to take ducks away from the second pile and leave the first pile alone. And that first pile has 5 ducks in it, 
So I look to my Beatty sequences, and C5 is next to 3. That means I should end up with 5 and 3, so I'll need to take 7 ducks away from this pile. Now Aurora might take 1 from this pile, leaving 4 and 3. Those have a ratio between 1 over phi and phi, so I know I need to match the difference. 3 minus 4 is negative 1, so I look for the pair with difference 1 in position 1, and I swap the order to get 2 and 1. That means I'll need to take 2 ducks from each pile. Finally, Aurora could take the duck on the right, which would leave me to remove all the ducks on the left and win. As ever, good game. I always find it amazing that there's so much beautiful math and so many surprising connections just beneath the surface of everything, even something as simple as playing a game with a friend. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.